Stop the Poles. The frozen extremities of our planet, as fascinating as they are hostile. A world where intense cold reigns, backed by furious winds. For so long inaccessible to man, their conquest was long and dangerous. But it's thanks to the determination of the first explorers that a huge amount of progress has been made, as geographical exploration has gradually given way to scientific exploration. Sophie Berger is a glaciologist who specializes in the Antarctic. She's about to embark on a voyage through time and space into these hostile territories. What you experience in these places marks you for the rest of your life. Inside your tent, you're constantly woken up by the cold. You look at the thermometer and see it's minus 52 degrees Celsius outside. And the only thing for a normal person to do is to get out of there fast. Watchdogs and witnesses of the environmental upheavals taking place across the globe, the Arctic and Antarctic are major natural laboratories for the study of climate change which is motivating the international research community. A journey to the ends of the Earth, a scientific investigation in the footsteps of the conquerors of the Poles. Inside its glass showcase sitting in dry dock is the MV Poltsjena, the Polar Star, a seal hunting ship and a witness of bygone days. It also crisscrossed the northern seas as an expedition vessel. When and how did Norway become a main player in polar exploration? Nobody imagined that the poor country that Norway was would take part in the race for the North Pole. In 1870, Norwegian scientists started expressing their desire to undertake a maritime expedition to the North Pole. But they were told by the authorities that this wasn't within Norway's scope. Then came Nansen in 1888, who wanted to cross Greenland on skis. Everyone in Norway thought he was nuts. No way could they spend money on such an enterprise. But after Nansen's success, Norway realized that it was capable of undertaking such expeditions and that it had among its population some of the best skiers and hunters in the world. So thanks to Nansen, Norway became a genuine polar nation. Fridjof Nansen, a scientist and exceptional explorer, whose crossing of Greenland would soon be surpassed by his next polar expedition. Gambling on a westward current across the ocean, Nansen put together a revolutionary plan. He decided to set out to conquer the North Pole. To do so, he commissioned a ship with a special shape, the Fram. It was designed so that it couldn't be damaged by ice. Nansen's idea was to freeze his ship into the pack ice, the farthest east possible, and then to drift with the east-west current to a point somewhere in between Greenland and Svalbard. It was a crazy idea, but he managed to convince people around him who donated the necessary funds, and his gamble almost paid off. Fridjof Nansen sailed his ship headfirst into the pack ice, making himself a voluntary prisoner in order to explore one of the last unknown open spaces on the planet. The Fram drifted for three years. Realizing that the current wasn't strong enough to get him to the pole itself, he and a companion disembarked and headed north with a team of dogs and sleds. Faced with intense cold and lacerated terrain dotted with ice ridges, he was forced to abandon his attempt at a latitude of 86 degrees 14 north, nonetheless setting a new farthest north record for a human being. It's hard to imagine a more hostile environment than this frozen ocean covered with drifting pack ice. An environment that was enthusiastically chosen by French explorer Jean-Louis Etienne almost a century later. 
It's constant chaos, a permanent struggle. You keep asking yourself, do I climb up, do I climb down? Sometimes a bit further on, there might be a flat section, but in general, it's all compression ridges, barriers of ice that form when two ice plates collide. They rise up, one against the other, forming walls, and you have to get over these four or five meter high obstacles, get your whole dog team up and over. And it can be extremely demoralizing. In 1986, he became the first man to reach the North Pole solo. Inside your tent, you're constantly woken up by the cold. You look at the thermometer and see it's minus 52 degrees Celsius outside. And the only thing for a normal person to do is to get out of there fast, because you're in danger. I have unlimited admiration for the pioneers. They had no idea where they were going. There was absolutely no communication, so it was impossible for them to send out a mayday if they were in trouble. Nansen is one of my biggest idols. Beyond his incredible feat, Nansen returned with a lot of valuable scientific data. How much do his conclusions still influence polar science today? By sounding different parts of the ocean at depths of several hundred meters, Nansen noted that there was a concrete link between the Atlantic Ocean and the Arctic Ocean, that the Atlantic current spilled into the Arctic Ocean, and that the freezing waters of the Arctic also came back to the Atlantic. So he understood the crucial role that the Arctic Ocean plays in the flows of water masses in the Northern Hemisphere. After analyzing his data, Nansen defined the foundations of modern climatology. Nansen made numerous observations in various fields. The most spectacular was probably the aurora borealis, whose beauty and poetic nature he described in his drawings and writings. A wonder that Sophie hoped to observe on a freezing but clear night. It's perfect here. No houses, no light pollution. Come on, little Aurora, come on. Is that her rising there? Oh, no. oh my God. <laughs> it's incredible. Magical. It's awesome seeing it for real. You've got to admit, nature's amazing. Hypnotizing, mesmerizing, the polar auroras long kept their secrets. It wasn't until the very late 19th century that scientists were finally able to explain them. Polar auroras, Borealis in the north, Australis in the south, are signs of disturbances in the Earth's magnetic fields caused by the solar wind, a cloud of particles released from the upper atmosphere of the sun. Planet Earth is surrounded by a protective magnetic shield called the magnetosphere. 
This shield deforms when it is impacted by streams of matter released by the sun. Behind our planet, hidden from the sun, these deformations stretch the shield like a rubber band. When the rubber band twangs, particles are catapulted at top speed towards Earth and the lines of the magnetic fields that converge at our north and south poles. These then collide with oxygen and nitrogen atoms present in the upper atmosphere, producing green and sometimes red or blue lights. We know that Nansen was a key figure in terms of science, but Amundsen, who was another giant in the exploration of the poles, was more of an adventurer. Amundsen wanted to continue Nansen's voyages on board the Fram. He wanted to explore the Arctic Ocean, and Nansen still wanted some answers to some remaining scientific questions that he had. So for Nansen, it was important to help Amundsen in his polar expedition, and he backed him 100%. Nearly all of the faculties of the University of Oslo became involved in the scientific program of the expedition. But in 1909, as Amundsen was in full preparation, there was a dramatic development. The American explorers Robert Peary and Frederick Cook both laid individual claims to having reached the North Pole. But through lack of solid proof, neither of these claims was officially recognized. Proof of the records was not established. It may be that neither reached the North Pole. Then came another turn of events that surprised the whole world. Amundsen, pretending to be heading for the North Pole, suddenly changed course and headed south. The South Pole, in the middle of Antarctica, a continent lashed by the fiercest freezing winds on the planet. A white desert strewn with ice ridges, ripped apart by vast crevices, and plunged into darkness six months a year. That year, 1910, a British team led by Captain Robert Falcon Scott was determined to be the first to reach the coveted South Pole. During his port of call at Madeira, Amundsen took care to inform his new rival by telegram. Beg to inform you, Fram preceding Antarctica. So it would be a race for the Pole after a six-month voyage across the oceans of the planet. On January the 14th, 1911, the Fram anchored in the Bay of Wales, a haven carved out of the continental shelf. Once on land, Amundsen set up his base camp. He had one obsession, to catch up with Scott, who had landed 10 days earlier on Ross Island. It would be impossible to cover the 1,500 kilometers to the pole in one go. So Amundsen spent several weeks of the southern summer installing three intermediary supply depots. In April, night fell, and the temperature fell too low to move. The wait at the camp was long. It wasn't until October that Amundsen and his men could finally embark on their gruelling race. He set off 12 days earlier than Scott and made fast progress, despite the huge difficulties and the elements which stretched human endurance to the extreme. On December the 14th, around 3 p.m., victory was his. The Norwegian expedition was the first to reach the South Pole. In his abandoned tent, Amundsen left instruments which might be of use to the British. He also left a letter for the King of Norway, in case he should die on the return to the coast. And he left a note for Scott, which ended with these words, with kind regards, I wish you a safe return. Scott, who reached the pole 33 days after his rival, 
died, along with his party, on the return, a prisoner of the Antarctic ice. It was a real adventure, going into uncharted terrain, parts of the planet where no one had ever set foot before. After that, the scientists arrived. A new era of polar exploration began. In the footsteps of the daring pioneers came the conquerors of knowledge. The founding event was what was called the International Geophysical Year, 1957 and 58, when all the nations with the necessary heavy logistics decided to study our planet and notably the polar regions. The International Geophysical Year is a combined effort of scientists of more than 60 nations to gain knowledge of the Earth and related phenomena by worldwide simultaneous observation. In Antarctica, scientists hope to find the answers to many questions which will unlock secrets of the universe. The International Geophysical Year involved more than 25,000 researchers and drew the attention of the entire world to the scientific interest of Antarctica. It marked the real starting point for international cooperation in polar research. More than 50 observation stations were established on the frozen continent. It served as proof that it was possible on our planet to have a place without borders and without commercial greed. An experiment that was prolonged by its political application. The Antarctic Treaty System signed in 1959. It froze all territorial claims, banned the exploitation of resources and determined Antarctica as a land of peace and science. but an inhospitable land, especially in the heart of the continent. There were only three scientific stations operational around the year. Amundsen Scott for the Americans, Vostok for the Russians, and the French-Italian research facility Concordia. For France, it's the Paul Emile Victor Polar Institute that operates this unique station, set on Dome C, at a height of over 3,200 meters. At Concordia, the average annual temperature is minus 54 degrees Celsius. In winter, it drops to minus 80. So it's an environment where everything is a challenge. Man's presence alone is a huge challenge. Man has no place there, can't exist there permanently. Man can merely be kept alive in such a remote freezing place. So every time we send an expedition there, our big question is, will we be able to bring them back safe and sound at the end of their mission? That's what you must guarantee every single time. One thousand one hundred kilometers from the coast, Concordia is supplied by convoys which deliver everything that's needed by the thirteen to fifteen people who spend all year there, and the fifty or so researchers who carry out their experiments during the southern summer. No other site in Antarctica has so many assets to make unique observations in so many different fields. The poles are sources of extremely varied knowledge, such as the study of earthquakes and the study of the magnetic field. The advantage of the polar stations is that they're far away from human activity, so the quality of the measurements is excellent. And these measurements tell us a lot about the Earth's deep mechanisms. We can learn all of this in the polar regions, even though it doesn't directly concern the poles. For example, a lot of work on astronomy is carried out there. At the poles, you can observe a particular star for an extremely long time, maybe for several months. So the conditions are excellent for astronomers. Then there are the more applied subjects, like glaciology, the sciences of the atmosphere or the sciences of the oceans. These involve mechanisms which we need to understand better because they have a very important impact on society as they're linked to the problems of climate change.
In the past 25 years, Antarctica has lost almost 3,000 billion tons of ice. And the disaster is worsening. Global warming is a massive machine, a planetary machine. Before, there was scientific evidence, but now we can see this evidence with our own eyes. In 1989, we crossed Antarctica from the tip of the peninsula to the opposite side, 6,500 kilometers away. Well, the first 600 kilometers have vanished from what's called the Larsen Ice Shelf. It's a platform of floating ice. The 600 kilometers we crossed at the start, plop, broke off and disappeared. When they break away from the continent, these ice platforms become gigantic tabular icebergs. However frozen it may be, an ice cap behaves like a liquid in that it slides down the natural inland slope to the sea. In Antarctica, the caps extend over the ocean, forming gigantic ice platforms several hundreds of meters thick. These floating platforms serve as buttresses to hold the ice resting on the rocky land in place. While the air above the majority of the Antarctic is constantly below freezing point, the main risk to ice stability comes from the surrounding ocean. Warmer ocean currents melt these buttresses from below, so much so that large quantities of ice break off and float away in the ocean. This process is the main reason for Antarctica's contribution to the current rising sea levels. It's also the field of research of Sophie Berger, who went on a mission to the German Nürmeyer station. During her two months, she sometimes had to face apocalyptic conditions. Looks nice outside. I knew before I went that it was one of the windiest continents in the world. But there's a huge difference between knowing and suddenly being there in the middle of a storm where you can barely walk and you're being pushed and pushed. You're concerned about your safety when you have to go outside. Frankly, it was scary. It's a continent where the weather determines where and when you can work. But the fact that it's daylight all the time, the moment the weather's fine, you can work at any hour. Your day might start at 3 o'clock in the morning if it's fine and you have work to do. You have to make the most of your trip to Antarctica and your time there to take a maximum number of measurements. You have this feeling of space that you don't get at all in Europe. It's hard to describe. You have a feeling of horizontality, a 360-degree view with practically nothing on the horizon. It's flat, snow-white, and totally majestic. You're on the remotest continent in the world, a place with no permanent habitats and almost no people. And yet, when you spend two months in the Antarctic, you're with people all the time. You share a base with 50 other people. You're never alone despite being in this immensity. This great white empty desert, it's really quite incredible. Antarctica a continent of 14 million square kilometers, 1.4 times the size of Europe, covered by ice an average of two kilometers thick. 
Antarctica's polar cap alone represents 70% of the planet's freshwater reserves. And as it melts, it makes a significant contribution to the rising sea levels. A major concern for our planet's societies, because two-thirds of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a coast. But while the poles are the watchdogs of climatic upheavals, they're also the first victims. Part of climate change is what experts call polar amplification, which means that the polar regions tend to have more marked changes than the rest of the world. And this is especially true of the Arctic. In a balanced climatic system, the air and ocean currents transport the energy accumulated in the tropics to the poles. The glacial covering compensates for this importation of warmth. Snow and ice send 60 to 80% of solar radiation back into space and so absorb little warmth. They're said to have a very high albedo. In a heating climate, increased warmth arrives from the tropics. Ice and other components of the cryosphere disappear, leaving behind water, rock and vegetation, the albedo of which is much lower than that of snow and ice. The resulting increase in the absorption of solar radiation leads to further warming, which again melts the ice, and so on and so on. But other mechanisms are at work too. The rise in the temperature of the atmosphere increases its ability to retain water vapor, thus creating low heavy clouds which cause the greenhouse effect that also leads to further warming. The increases in the temperature of the Arctic are now considerable. At the Nee Allison Scientific Station in the heart of Svalbard, the average winter temperature has risen by three degrees per decade over the past few decades, which was totally unthinkable. But now, in a place where in winter the ocean was completely frozen, you look out from the station and you see the ocean completely free of ice all year round. Within the confines of the Arctic Circle, in the Svalbard archipelago, is Nialzund, the world's northernmost village. At a latitude of 79 degrees north, it's a little over a thousand kilometers from the pole. Despite the apparent calm between mid-April and the end of August, when the sun never sets, there are thousands of researchers working here. This unique village hosts the scientific stations of 11 European and Asian countries. Their researchers are trying to understand the global climate changes caused by our two poles. None of the houses are locked, so that anyone on the street can take shelter in case a polar bear passes through. The rules are strict, no leaving the village unarmed. And only imminent danger can justify shooting a polar bear. They have been protected since 1973, following overhunting. The glaciers surrounding Nialzund are also a field of investigation for scientists. Ostrolovan is one of the 450 reference glaciers in the world. It's been studied by French researchers since the 1960s. On this mission, they have a host of tasks to accomplish. Among them is the installation of ice beacons using a rudimentary but extremely efficient process. I'm good here. There's pressure all along. Perfect. Here we're at 1.5 meters by 10. We've set up a fairly comprehensive network of ice beacons on this glacier. Let me show you on the map. 
There are 30 or so beacons, so it's a pretty dense network. We're at point B9, which you can see just above. This network will enable us, from the ablation zone below, where we're losing most ice, to the higher ground, to see which zones are losing or gaining in ice, and to what extent. By integrating all this on the scale of the glacier, we'll see whether the mass balance is negative, meaning losses are superior to gains, or if it's positive. How has the glacier been behaving recently? We'll need to have a few long series to measure the trend, about 30 years of climatic series to get a real idea. But what we do know for certain is that the glacier is getting smaller because all its parameters are negative. Retreating, getting thinner. Exactly. All the indicators are in the red. But that's a phenomenon which, since we started measuring measurements 12 years ago, is amplifying. This time we're here to sink one of our ice beacons deeper. We sunk it in 2016, so it's already done three seasons. This is one of the most dynamic areas on the glacier, so we've lost over eight metres in depth of ice. And as we sink the beacons to 9.5 metres deep, we have to re-sink them quite regularly. You've lost eight metres of ice in three years? Right. It's easily measurable, and it's pretty consequential. All the more reason to maintain an operational monitoring network. The ice beacon, composed of five coloured two-metre sections, is sunk deep into the ice. These beacons will allow the researchers to measure the summer thaw and establish the glacier's bill of health. 31. 31 black, precisely. How much of the change you see here is due to climate change? We're in the Arctic, so we're faced with the process of polar amplification, where, compared to general global warming, we're at two to three degrees warmer than before the Industrial Revolution. So climate change is much more exacerbated in the Arctic. And compared to the Arctic in general, on Spitsbergen, in the Svalbard archipelago, it's rising even faster. There are anomalies, notably in winter, when the temperature rises to 6, 10, 12 degrees above the normal average during certain months, which is considerable. So this place is a real marker. It's symptomatic of the climate changes that are taking place. It's not only on the glaciers that the effects of global warming can be seen. In the ocean, the same phenomenon is occurring, with sometimes unexpected consequences. Deep on the ocean bed, large quantities of methane are trapped in the sediments in the form of gas hydrates, crystalline structures which are frozen mixtures of gas and water. After carbon dioxide, methane is the second biggest contributor to global warming. So the increase of its emissions into the atmosphere is one cause of climate change. This is the field of research of Giuliana Panieri, whose lab is studying what this process could mean to the future of the climate and the Arctic environment. Wow, 
This really is the Arctic. Yeah, uh, this is the Arctic. So this is a tough uh, environment and uh, it is not easy to collect data in this place. So we are very lucky when uh, after our expedition we can come back with the data and with samples on which we can uh, work. Is there a lot of methane here? Oh yeah, of course. Yes, there is a lot of methane which is uh, released from uh, the Arctic Ocean. It can be methane which is stored in the sediment as a free gas, but it can be methane uh, uh, which is from gas hydrate dissociation. So we could potentially see some bubbles at the sea surface. And why is it important to study gas hydrates? Well, first of all, we have to keep in mind that in one cube meter of gas hydrate, there are 164 cube meters of methane. So it is uh, an unconventional uh, uh, source of energy. The gas hydrate uh, uh, forms when uh, there is a high pressure and uh, uh, low temperature. So very often we find them along the continental margins. And uh, if you, for example, decrease the pressure or if you increase uh, uh, the temperature, then the gas hydrate can destabilize, which means uh, that they can provoke slumping or submarine landslides. But we have to keep in mind that uh, the, the methane is a greenhouse gas. So warming a small amount of gas hydrate might uh, potentially liberate a huge amount of methane that can uh, um, be liberated and then go and rise into the water column and potentially also in the atmosphere. This might potentially affect uh, global warming. The scientists are trying to retrace the history of methane emissions and to identify their causes, whether climatic or seismic. Vital information for the future of our planet. Understand the past to predict the future. To reconstruct our climate's history, glaciologists are carrying out in-depth studies and making the ice talk. The refrigerated warehouses of the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research in Germany stores almost 3,000 ice cores ready to reveal their secrets. Two. Okay. Oh. So here are some ice cores. Cool. From Antarctica. Where is it coming from? It's coming from a coastal site called Neumeier. It's a German station just on the coast. So we can take this and uh, we have to unpack it. The two glaciologists very carefully install the ice core extracted at a depth of 95 meters. It's beautiful. It's amazing to think that this piece of ice is a genuine archive of our past climate. Yeah, exactly. You know, ice is made up of basically compacted snow and snow layer by layer, year by year, compacts into ice. And this is exactly a stratified material, so it's a climate archive. Each layer can tell you an information about a specific year back in the past. For example, this ice course, which is roughly one meter long, it probably can contain five to six years uh, based on the accumulation rate on the specific site where it was taken from. And therefore, of course, can tell you some information about for example, temperature in this specific location. What causes the differences between annual layers? So let's say, for example, we can observe in this case some layers where you have no bubbles, like there's one here. It's a really thin strip of ice that is more transparent and more clear compared to the rest. Yeah, they're big here. 
Basically, they are caused by um, the melting of snow on the surface and the water percolating down, down to a certain depth where the temperature is getting colder, so the water actually refreezes at certain depths. So this somehow mark, or it tells you that it was a specific summer where it was particularly warm. And this is nice to see when you actually use some light. Ooh. What's special about ice cores for me compared to other climatic archives is the fact that they contain samples of the past atmosphere. Yeah, I think this is the one of the unique thing about ice cores that we can measure the past atmosphere because we have bubbles trapped inside, so it's not an indirect measurement of it, it's a direct measurement of it. So we can measure all the composition of the atmosphere back in the past uh, for hundreds of thousands of years. They give you information about, for example, concentration of greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, all of this information are really useful for us, of course, to understand the variation, the variability of it, back in the past and then to understand what might be, of course, the future and what might be the impact of this variation on the future climate. To determine the precise age of an ice core, you must link all the information it contains to particular events, such as nuclear testing or volcanic eruptions, which leave traces in the air bubbles trapped inside the ice. Ice which is prepared and cut before being melted for analysis. The ice is melting and the melt water is transmitted through tubes to the system, so it's feeding kind of this system, and we have different instruments to measure different things. So at the moment we are uh, looking uh, mainly at the water isotopes, and it's, this is the main information is the ratio between the oxygen 18 and the oxygen 16. So we can derive from this ratio the temperature, how cold or warm was a particular year uh, from the ice. But this is not the only thing we measure here. Also, we are pretty interested in uh, dust. You can see in the screen, for example, the calcium value, which is the purple curve just over here. Yeah. It has some oscillation over time, so in the ice. So different layers have different amount of calcium. This probably reflects some variation in the dust or in the amount of dust. Uh, gives you some uh, um, clues on how many storms you have in a particular year because the dust is brought indeed by storms. Similar things you can observe already also in the uh, oxygen values, low to high values. This probably means that we are going from a layer that was uh, winter values, very low to higher values. So probably we are going from winter to summer. So this is one year that we are seeing in the data. And combining this information with the paleo temperature, we can really see or we can really get a good picture of how was the climate in some particular regions at one particular year. It's incredible to think that the ice core we cut up together is a kind of book on the history of the climate, the history of Earth's past, and we're analyzing it page by page, line by line, word by word almost. It's absolutely fascinating. The oldest ice available to paleoclimatologists is 800,000 years old. But to unlock the mysteries behind the workings of the climate, a new project called Beyond Epica Oldest Ice has recently been launched. Its researchers are on a quest to find ice from one and a half million years ago, before any major upheavals in the Earth's climatic system, when glacial periods were longer, and the rhythm of glacial-interglacial cycles swung between 40,000 to 100,000 years. The question is, um, what did cause this different behavior of the climate system. And if we had higher greenhouse gas concentrations uh, back in time. We learned from 
The 800,000 years, which is the EPICA project um, we had uh, some 20 years ago. Uh, we observe that we have a temperature variation, so we can uh, reconstruct the temperature in the core uh, that goes between warm periods and cold periods. In the same phasing and consistent with this, with this we have a CO2 change between 180 and 280 ppm in the natural system. So um, as you might uh, know, now we are beyond 400 ppm, so we put the natural variability on top of the uh, record by human activity. And the question is, of course, in what climate system do we run? So uh, as climate researchers, we look for uh, states of the climate system where we had higher CO2 records. So we look for a continuous record where we can go back in time, coming from the surface, penetrating deeper and deeper. What are the difficulties you face when trying to drill down to two kilometers? I mean, 2,000 meters or almost three kilometers is quite far away, so I often imagine it laterally. If you think three kilometers away in the horizontal, it's quite some distance, and uh, you go this distance down. And uh, they have done a lot of radar profiles to really find a nice spot where you, you see structure in it and uh, have criteria fulfilled. To drill an ice core dating back to a million years, you must first find a layer of ice thick enough to give a good resolution. This resolution depends on snowfall. In places with little snowfall, the layer of accumulated ice is fine, so one meter of it will contain many years. However, places with regular heavy snowfall give a better resolution, but when the ice accumulates in too thick a layer, it transforms into an isolating covering and starts melting at the base due to heat emanating from the Earth's core. So you must find a compromise between the right thickness for good resolution and not too thick in order to collect the precious ancient layers. The second constraint is to find near immobile ice. Because ice tends to slide from the higher ground of the Antarctic towards the sea, mixing up the layers. Domes are part of the polar cap where instead of downward sliding, there is vertical compression. Consequently, they're the perfect locations to drill for ice cores. This is Little Dome C, about 40 kilometers from Concordia, the site which was finally chosen. Drilling should begin in two years' time and last until 2025. If they're successful, the scientists might be able to solve one of the great mysteries of the climate and better understand the evolution of our planet. The polar regions play a crucial role as genuine scientific laboratories, irreplaceable in trying to understand upheavals in our climate. For this reason, they are of great interest for the entire human race. But these incredibly rich oases of ice and snow are now vulnerable and under threat. Today, there's an average global warming of one degree Celsius compared to 150 years ago. When you hear one degree Celsius, it seems totally ridiculous, like it's no big deal. Day and night, we all experience much bigger differences than one degree Celsius. And yet, one degree Celsius on a planetary scale is quite considerable. If we look back 18,000 years to the last Great Ice Age, the channel didn't exist. You could walk from France to England. The oceans were 120 meters shallower than they are today. France was a polar tundra, not the forest-covered country we know today. The difference in temperature between 18,000 years ago and now is only four to five degrees. In the past 150 years, we've added one degree.